to start our public hearing for March 27, 2018. Roll call, please. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Here. Councilman Jason Hood. Here. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Here. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Here. Councilman Mike Williams. Hey, number one. Number one, an ordinance to amend the City of Hammond budget for fiscal year 2017-2018 in accordance with the procedure set within section 5-03 of the City of Hammond Charter. Say the naive. Second. Good evening, everyone. Any question for me? <laughs> you want to just go, we're going to go over the... Uh... Um, we are just amending the budget because there is a variance, more than 5%, so. Number two, an ordinance to approve an expanded conditional use request by Channing Garrett, applicant to allow placement of 2012 mobile home which has is meeting all code requirements on lot 11, square four, Kenmore edition located at 606 Campo Street, zone RS-3, <coughs> recommended denied by zoning commission, Tracy Shalacy. Good afternoon, council. Um, this is a proposal to place a mobile home on a lot that fronts Campo Street. Um, it was recommended for denial by the zoning commission. Um, it's not in a proposed mobile home area, and it's also in a um, flood way. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's here on this case, but um, okay. Um, he also applied for a variance that was denied by the um, zoning commission. That um, our zoning rules require you to have a front-facing door, and because it's a mobile home, it's kind of hard to fit a trailer on a narrow lot with a front door facing. Um, we did discuss with him if it was approved um, to place them over home there, if there was any way he could maybe cut a door in that end um, of the mobile home. I don't think he was opposed to that, um, but I, we scheduled a meeting and, and that didn't happen, so I'm not sure what his feelings are about that today, but um, this so is- So the lot, is the lot not, it's rectangular or something? So you would it, move it's the a, door it's from a, where it is to another? Another place in the, in, a mobile home? in the mobile home? Move what, Is I'm that, sorry? I mean, you would want them to add a door to the mobile home? To, to accommodate for the zoning requirements, our um, zoning district requirements, it requires for a front-facing door. Well, the lot is 50 foot by 160. So, of course, the mobile home would have to, you know, face the long way, the long way yeah. And you need to agree to all the savings. Yeah, we talked about Would they have to use that door or would they just have to put a door there? Just um, curious. Our code says it has to be an entry door. Okay. Now, if he uses door. it as one thing, but. I know that um, it is in a floodway, so we require really strict um, engineered footings for this mobile home. Um, we require one foot of freeboard now, so the bottom of the the I beam has to be one foot above base flood elevation, um, and he would have to have engineer drawings, also a no rise certificate from an engineer. So there's some hurdles there. He'd have to produce. So is it already there? No, the property is vacant. So the property is vacant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I talked to him about that, and he said what he was going to do with it. He's aware of all everything he has to provide. I got a question about that door deal. It ain't a lot around here that you can almost park a 75 or 80 foot trailer to where the door has to swing to the road. You're right. So why would they have it in there? Um, when we wrote, rewrote our code, it's something that they wanted in the design. Um, there's a good example of, I'm trying to think where is, I think it's right here, right by McGee Financial. They just built a duplex. Um, they were going to have a blank wall because how narrow the lot was. We talked to them about designing and putting a door facing the street. They actually have two doors facing um, the side lot and then one facing the street. <coughs> so you're not looking at a blank wall. You actually have an entryway. 
And you can you, you can do it. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, but that's what a building that they yeah. were building. Yeah. You talking about something that's already been manufactured. Correct. So you talking about changing something that's already exists and, and, and placing a door where none should never have been? What's the side setbacks? Um, they, they would have they would have enough room for the side setbacks. Yeah, we have a site plan showing a driveway and his setbacks. So he did ask for a variance to put a door inside. I'll leave the door. Already. He asked. Yeah, he asked for a variance to not have a front facing door. So, um, and they denied that. So so let's say we had a Mr. President. Let's say we had a lot that let would say we had a trailer that was in a trailer approved area with <clears throat> that same dimensions of a lot. Yeah, I guess the question would be is would, at some point we would have to kind of think through that because to Councilwoman Beard's point, we're probably not going to retrofit a trailer for a door. But I, could, I mean, I grew up in, in, in Charleston where we had houses that were rectangular and there was a, sure. we called them a porch door. Mm -hmm. So it was a door that you went onto the porch and you went into the house. So it was a side facing type of a structure. I lived in one. Mm -hmm. So I know what you're talking about, but from a trailer perspective, it seems like that would be kind of almost impossible. So if we're going to have spots where trailers are going to be legal, or we're going to approve those because they're zoned for trailers, then we should probably fact think about, you know, what happens if we have a, a lot like that? How does that look and how do we, Correct. You know, how do we design that? That's yeah. probably a good conversation and do you for us to have the zoning the board. Oh, the he, structure. You, you could. I mean, you'd have to meet all the building codes that require that you to do that. It probably yeah. costs more to put that door in than it costs for the whole mobile home. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that means that that would probably be a space where mobile homes just couldn't be. Right. Or basically. exempt or exempt mobile homes from having the front-facing door. You know? Or exempt mobile homes mm -hmm. from having front-facing doors. Yeah. Okay. So am I right in saying, Mr. President, that we're here at a, for a public hearing, but it seems like there's still lots of work to still be done on this, on this project before it even gets to the point where it comes out. So based on what you're saying, because these like, normally if you had those things in there, they would be conditional, conditioned upon these one, two, three, four, five things happening. But you're saying that even if they do those things, then it's still not going to reach a level of approval from the zoning board? No, I'm saying if he, if he created the front facing door that met code, then that would be, he wouldn't have to worry about that variance being approved. He would have to meet our building code and our zoning code requirement, I mean, our um, floodplain requirements right. as far as engineering and, you know, skirting the trailer and making right. sure everything else meets. So it's being denied because those haven't been met yet? No, it was being denied because it's not in a proposed mobile home area. Okay. And it's in a flood way. Okay. That's the key. I'm say, isn't there uh, a, a, a truck mobile homes already there? There, you have a map. We did a um, yeah mobile home survey of the area. There's several older mobile homes, or the most. When the one recently put there? The the most recent mm -hmm. mobile home is yeah, right just. This. It's on the same street. It's probably about four four or five lots down. Yes, it, but it doesn't front on the canal side. It's actually on the west side of the street. Mm -hmm. How high is he have to lift this thing? I don't know what the BFE is going to be. I mean, he has to get a. If you see that particular mobile home she's talking about, it's pretty high. Um, yeah, it's pretty high off the ground. This one would probably build a little higher than that. But like I said, he'd have to have engineered footings because of that floodway. I like, to, I like to go out there and visit the area, Mr. President, just to be honest with you. He agreed to do the door. He did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We talked about it. Okay. He actually said, I never even thought about that. Yeah. But did um, he ever talk to anybody to find out if that was engineeringly possible without, I mean, if it, is it a brand new mobile home? Yeah. So we're talking about maybe uh, destroying the structure integrity of this thing to comply? No, I don't think so. They put a header above the door of the structure, so. <clears throat> Well, I guess you can say it ain't going to take away from but I, I guess that depends on what was there before the door. Yeah. I mean, you know, if the toilet was there, then I guess it will. I'm looking at the drawing. I'm, I'm assuming that where these X's are, or that's are these X's, that's... 
That's I, wish had, I wish we had a way to show the public these drawings too. Ex so we can, existing yeah. um, mobile homes in the area. Okay. Most of them are really, and, really and so old. Where, where, which, lot would, which lot are we referring to for this gentleman? The one that's cross hatched in the red. A lot 11 right here. I can't. My drawing, I don't think my drawing has that. You have that one, and you also have an aerial with the um, cross hatch. Do you have a number on it? You got a old trailer sitting there, and it's, it's not facing the road. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. All, all that stuff was incorporated in our, our new. Old um, trailer sitting there, and doors not facing. Yeah. Did you find it? Yeah, but I see like lot eleven. So where where would the trailers be on this plan that I'm looking at now? I see the lot eleven with this red. So that's it's, his lot. Okay. So so all the other lots here, like. 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, of those, where are the trailers are? Because it doesn't, it, we don't have the X's on this particular plan. Yeah. Like we're doing the other one. So maybe I mean, we can have that so we can look at it. So we're trying to. Um, well, on the street shot, this shot has trailers on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got mobile homes on it. This is his, so um, his yeah, lot here. He's doing the side, isn't he? Okay. So we're trying to make a decision on because you know so so the other things that you brought up and I'm, I'm going to be this is my last question the other things you brought up really aren't even a factor right now because the first two things is one we have to probably would have to give a variance to be in a place that's a non-mobile home designated area first, even though... Well, you know, you, you're only voting to allow mobile home. Okay. Everything else, he would have to meet our requirements. Yeah, but typically when y'all do that, you will say in the ordinance, you will say con contingent upon, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, but you're not saying that here. You're just, you're just saying denial. So we would then just right because they didn't account. they didn't approve it with any conditions they just denied it. That's you know point. you have your on your staff report you have the normal standard conditions we usually put that they have to meet. Um, so 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 then if we were to, to override the denial, then the owner would not have to do anything else except move because you're not you're not we're not putting any conditions Condition in there if we just override the denial. He would still have to meet the front door. Well, where is that written anywhere? Well, because the variance was denied and the, the override of variance would have to go to district court. That's not something you would override. And he's willing to do that, he, uh, you know. Okay. I'm confused. But <clears throat> the only thing you have to approve is to allow him to put the mobile home there. Everything else, he would have to meet the requirements, be it engineered footings, um, a front-facing door. And you would have to come back to us for that? No. Okay. So all we're really doing is saying, since there are already mobile homes there, if we say we can put a mobile home there, if the, if the council decides that, then that would be okay. I mean, he'd have to meet everything else that we would But, right, but yeah. we, have, we would not be a part of that no. process? No, correct. Okay. Okay. That's my question. Now we, we Louise Bostick, 112 Elm Drive. I, I'm also familiar with that area, Johnny. And this, in order to put that trailer there in that floodway, it's not just a flood zone, it's floodway, that thing would have to be six, eight feet off the ground. And I think. You're right, you need to go look at it. But you're not, you know, you're almost voting, if you vote in favor, you're almost voting in favor of putting these folks in a very hazardous position, which would cost a great deal of money to uh, resolve. Just wanted to make that comment. Sure, on that point that you just made, Louise, since you brought it up, that's why I was trying to clarify, because really the responsibility of the structure is really going to be removed from the council, because the council is making one decision. You know, you know, if a, if a, if a landowner wants to make that meet the requirements, that would but be up to that person, not us. But if we're, 
So that falls back on the Zoning and Planning Commission to do their due diligence to make that happen. And all we're saying is... And there are reasons that those places are not zoned for mobile homes. <clears throat> I'm going to move into a later session. She has another question. Mm -hmm. I'm Nick Gagliano, 902 West Colorado Street. That's the house next to the big red um, mound of dirt out there. But anyway, what I just wanted to, um, before you get into your meeting, is thank the council for the ordinance that you passed a few weeks ago about the filming regulation. I want to publicly thank you guys for looking after small businesses and the changes that Councilman Hood made and the council agreed upon. I appreciate you looking out and the mayor and his staff. So um, I just want to thank you publicly before you started your meeting. That's You're it. Welcome, thank you. Rick. Move into our regular session. Roll call, please. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Here. Councilman Jason Hood. Here. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Here. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Here. Councilman Mike Williams. I don't think he's here. Councilman yes, West, would you come lead us in prayer, please? <clears throat> Let us pray. Father God, we acknowledge that you are the supreme being and there's no God besides you. Father, we thank you for all things being as well as they are. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for this mayor. We thank you for this board of council. And we pray for them, dear God, that they will make godly choices and decisions. Grant them your wisdom from on high and keep them mindful, God that they are accountable to you to make the godly choices and decisions, that they are fair, just, and equitable, that every citizen of the city of Hammond, Louisiana, will be recipient of the blessings and the benefit of this great United States of America. Father, we do pray that all things are done decent and in order, and that when it is all said and done, you'll get the glory, the honor, and the praise and the kingdom of God, the good, and all mankind, and opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Sure. Uh, I salute the flag and all veterans, if you can render the proper salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. We got uh, Mr. Eddie Fisher. You want to come up? Yes. Yeah. State your name and address, please. Um, my name is Eddie Fisher, Sr., um, 40114 Net Drive, Ponchatoula. Eddie Fisher, Jr., 40114 Net Drive, Ponchatoula, also. Uh, we're here seeking a, an expanded condition use for alcohol license. Um, we are presently opening up a billiard hall at uh, 42309 South Morrison, the old Ramada Inn, um, Red Roof Inn Hotel. And I just here to come before the council to see if that's possible. We don't want to be, we're looking for the, to get rid of the 60-40 split just for that area, uh, but we don't have to sell more food than alcohol because it is a gaming, it is a billiard hall, not a bar, not a club. And I brought some pictures to show you how we're going to start and what it looks like already, if I can approach. This is not your ordinary um, billiard hall. This, this billiard hall is going to be statewide. Uh, we're going to attract a lot of business to Hammond. 
Uh, we're going to create jobs and a lot of revenue. Um, I'm going to let my son elaborate a little bit more on what we're trying to do. Uh, <coughs> the nightcap. You have to state your name. And, oh, you have to state your name. He did already. Right. That's fine. Okay. Sure. That's right. You guys have the same name. Just one. <laughs> yes, sir. Eddie Jr., 4014 Net Drive, Punch to Louisiana. Um, the nightcap is going to be an original complex. It's going to be a professional billiard hall. These are not just your ordinary tables that you see in, you know, various bar rooms that you have around here. These are $6,000 tables. These are tables that professionals play on. Uh, these tables are known to attract many, a variety of people from youthful, collegiate demographic all the way to adults the same. Uh, we have in plans to have multiple tournaments uh, held weekly and bigger team tournaments, which draws from the east side of Texas all the way through the Florida Panhandle. Uh, different teams can be coming into the area, spending money in Hammond, staying in our hotels, uh, spending money in our area. It can come in, so it's going to be a major tourist attraction for this area. Uh, this is something that's never been done on the North Shore to this magnitude. Um, it's gonna, we're going to go in with we'll hold charity events for different causes, raising money you know, for the good of mankind. We're going provide, to provide jobs for all ages. Uh, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to be in need of bartenders, cooks, security, uh, managers, um, clerks for our retail shops. Um, like I said, this is not your ordinary, this is not a pool hall, this is a professional billiard hall. And um, How many tables do you have total? Uh, we're going to have 13 tables total. So with 13 tables, we'll be able to hold 28, a team tournament of 28. There's 28 different teams with eight, per, eight people per team. And like I said, the teams will travel from east side of Texas all the way through the Panhandle, Florida, up north of Tennessee sometimes. They come all the way down to, to play. The only place that, uh, that, that, that can really hold that many people around here would be somewhere in New Orleans called uh, Buffalo Billiards. Uh, but we're trying to bring this to the North Shore. We want to bring this to our, you know, to our area, to our neck of the woods, to our backyard, because this would be a great revenue for the city. Is it okay that you want to mention the, the Yes, I, I brought uh, with me. I got Ms. Kim and her husband, Joe Holden, they are, they're the league operators for the APA. It is known as the largest pool uh, league in America with over 500,000 members. And they have roughly, I don't know how many teams they have, but if she could, she would like to explain. Right. My name is uh, Kimberly Leckenberry. I actually live in Livingston Parish, uh, 28759 LJ Methvin Road, Holden, Louisiana, 70744. Um, I'm currently the league manager for the local American Pool Players Association franchise that we, we operate in Tangipahoa Parish, Pike County, Mississippi. We currently have 44 teams that play weekly. Um, like he said, it's eight people per team. Um, we run three triannual tournaments to qualify teams for our world qualifier. Um, currently, our revenue goes to Macomb, Mississippi, Ponchatoula, and Amy because that's where all of our teams are located. Um, at one time, the, uh, the league operator, did, the previous league operator, did have 30-ish teams in this area, in Hammond alone. That was 180 players. Um, once this, this place opens and it becomes a host location, then they're, they're qualified or eligible to host triannual and world qualifier tournaments. Um, we do currently have teams that are very interested in playing out of here. Um, they're currently looking to move from um, one of our locations in Ponchatoula to this area. Um, we're also looking to begin regional tournaments and singles regionals and invitationals here. Um, what that means is that we will be pulling from all the way from Texas all the way to Florida, inviting other teams to come in, to come stay in the hotel rooms in this area, to come uh, spend their money in the restaurants, spend their money in this pool hall. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's money for the city. Um, and we're also looking to institute a juniors program. Um, the way that our juniors program works is it's every other week. It's for ages 7 to 17, um, but it'll get the local youth involved. Uh, we don't really pull from them as far as future players or anything like that. It's just something to promote the sport of billiards. So when the youth are playing, it's, it's, is it just unique for the youth or 
Is it intermixed with adults and youth, youth at the same time? Um, no. Whenever the adults come in to play with the youth, um, it's they're not playing. They're there as coaches. Um, it's more their parents come in, teach them a few things on the table. We're usually there, me and my fiance are usually there to promote the sport, to show them a few things on the pool table. But it gives them something to do after school um, or something to do even on the weekends, on Sundays or Saturdays. I mean, we haven't really flesh that out too well yet, but we're, that we really right now don't have an area where we can bring the youth in and can do a juniors sort of league. And what's unique about this building here is we have two separate areas. We have a large ball area with eight tables, then we got five and another room. A totally different room. Totally different room. So if you and know, then the bar is actually it's totally, yes. separate, totally separate, way away. Right. Totally separate. I saw that. That's all we have. So you know, Mr. President, just a couple of things on it. <clears throat> you know, we were talking and I and you know talking about you know like if we put these put this particular business in the category that we put the. Um, you know, our bowling alley or our, our movie theater, where our movie theater pretty much is a movie theater that also, you know, sells alcohol and have good reclining seats in there. And they've enhanced their movie theater. And for those adults who want to have a drink while they're watching a the movie, they're more than welcome to. And it's, it's a really nice remodeled design. And uh, so one thing I, 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 I want to make sure that we're not going to do is put Businesses in jeopardy by by forcing uh, this the 60-40 rule is not even that's not even their intent, right? You know because it doesn't really make any sense for us to do that. We should we should at least think through those processes because we want we want you guys to be successful. If you're going to open and invest those thousands and thousands of dollars, yes. you know, for us to have a place a billiard hall, you know, because it's, it's not a place it's a billiard. It's a billiard. Yes. Billiard. It's that's the fancy word you use when yes. it's a fancier yeah. place, right? Yeah, these all the tables right. that they use right. in Las Vegas. So, so it's a billiard yeah. hall where people who are professional pool players right. and people who want to play pool or do play play pool can actually have a place to go and and play the sport. Yes, sir. So I think it's a I think it's a good thing. I have a question. Is the 60-40 split just for restaurants, or is it for, how, how does that work? I mean, if you want to sell, like, snacks, you know, because it's not, like, a big restaurant, you're not going to have, like, sit-down steak dinners, right? No, no, ma'am. Right? It's just going to be, like, snacks, yes. like, finger food type thing? Finger food, like hot dogs, hamburgers, you know, less small stuff quick that somebody will grab while they plan a game or they come back, something like that. Okay, so uh, for the most part, uh, the refreshments uh, is what you want to sell, but you will sell food because? Because that's what the, you know, if they're there, they're out of town, they like to come get some chicken but wings or whatever, we'll have that available just for them. Like, yes, ma'am. like finger foods. So is that, is it required to do the 60-40 with that? Eddie, Junior. Yes, sir. <clears throat> just to clarify, so everybody knows, you're a DJ. Yes, sir. You're not going to have a bar room. No, sir. I'm not going to have uh, the police department having to go over there because, like, we tend to have to do on our strip at times with bars where you, you DJ, you know, yes, sir. talking to your dad about things if you do do that. So this will not be a bar room period other than having a bar like the bowling alley. No, sir, not at all. Um, I haven't personally. I haven't. I got out of the DJing world about two years ago, okay. and I started a lawn care business and. Uh, I'm very, very, I always have been interested in billiards, and I finally had the opportunity to open a, to, you know, attempt to open a billiard hall, and that's what we really want to do, honestly, just have a professional billiard hall. I think as long as you're not doing the bar. I mean, yes, sir. Obviously, I've been knowing you a while. And yes, sir, absolutely. Like pool, so. Okay. So, Mr. President? So, Andre, could you clarify something for me? I think there's a, always been a perception that there's no there's a moratorium on bars in Hammond. That's what I've always heard. There's simply a re rezoning request, yes, correct? Yeah. So is the rezoning request that Councilman Marshall mentioned about the movie tavern or the movie theater, whatever it's called, would that be the same thing as a bar room or is that a different well, what zoning you, classification? It, it's not a zoning issue. What you've allowed is an expanded conditional use. Okay. So what 
you've done that. And when I recommended, this instance came to me, we had conversations about this over time. My recommendation was that these folks get their permit for a billiard hall and they're licensed and permitted and they can do a billiard hall. Well, if they want to sell alcohol in their billiard hall, then they request the expanded use of being able to serve alcohol, like the movie theater. Now, bowling alley is probably grandfathered Grandfather in, right. but like the, the, the uh, spa that you're allowed to serve wine, I don't know if you remember that right. uh, a year right. or so ago. So, so my recommendation was you guys get your permit and you, you're licensed then to operate a billiard hall, and that's in place. And then if you want to then sell alcohol, which is not allowed in that area, you make a request with planning and zoning for that expanded conditional use. 60-40 food sales would not be Effective. relevant there. Right. And then that's, that's up to, to them to make their recommendation, then come before the council and you all decide if that's appropriate for this business. Okay. And now we kind of have the process of what might need to take place if we right. want to move forward with that. Okay. Okay. All right. So, well, good luck to you so, so what's the next? I think, I think uh, Andre. You, you need to get permitted. You okay. Go to Jenny, I guess, in your office, Jenny, Jenny Wilson, and, and fill out the paperwork and the application, meet all the qualifications for the billiard hall. Okay. Get your license for that. And then you go to planning and zoning with your license and say, look, now we want to serve alcohol, whatever that is. There are different degrees of that. Yes, sir. And then go to them with your business plan and say, we'd like to do this and make that request. Then you'll have a hearing before the, that commission, and then they'll make their recommendation, and that'll come back up to the council for, for a final for decision. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Andre. All right. Okay. Nice Thank you, all. Appreciate it. Good luck. Good luck. Okay, we got one more council report. Oh yeah, uh, Mr. President, uh, I I know we had mentioned to. Uh, uh, Pat Ferris, our marshal, that um, last year during um, when I was president, that we would have you, your, you guys back to kind of review your budget, where you are, how things are going. I uh, know we made some cuts in the budget, and so uh, you request to come and present where you guys are to the to the council, and the president is, uh, is acknowledging that you you can do that. So at this time, we want to come up and talk, address the council. Thank you, Mr. President, Council. Pat Ferris, 7th Ward Marshal, 303 East Thomas Street, Hammond, Louisiana. I have a prepared statement here, and then any questions that you folks may have, I'll be more than happy to take them from you. During our budget hearings, which took place in June, it was decided by majority to reduce the Marshal's Office operation budget allocation by $50,000. This was also in addition to a $40,000 reduction by the Tangipahoa Parish Council and a reduction of $50,000 by the City of Punchatoula Council. All I'm asking here tonight is you folks just revisit the recommendation that you guys made during the June budget hearing. At that time, the council did discuss and agreed to review the city marshal's profit loss actuals after a six month period. For that six months, our profit loss actuals show a little over 18,000 deficit, almost exactly $18,149 of deficit in six months. I'm asking this council to amend the 2017-2018 operating budget for the city to allow for a $25,000 allocation to the city marshal's office. This amount would offset our current deficit and would assist us greatly to complete the rest of this fiscal year. That's my statement and I do have some P&Ls if, uh, if y'all would like to see, if y'all would like to see I'd those. I'd like to see one of those. <coughs> May I and, and also, um, Mr. President, you know, you know, Pat, um, you also, how did you offset, obviously, 140 grand, um, I know you didn't cut all that out of your expenses, so you generated additional revenue, and how did you do that? Um, the, the additional revenues are, are, the, are the largest additional revenue 
let, 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 me, let me back up just a little bit because we have several revenue sources, okay? And one is certainly the, the city of Hammond, and um, one is the Tangipahoa Parish Council. Um, they allocate certain amounts of, of, of money uh, to the marshal's office each year. Uh, we also have a criminal court cost, um, which um, allocates, what that is, is the city marshal's office receives $30 per, um, per either citation or, or criminal matter that may come through our court. And um, just like along with those, those allocations are broken down by the, the court gets its fee, the marshal's office gets its fee, uh, public defender's office gets its fee, and, and so on and so forth. There are several other um, agencies that, that receive fees from those court costs. Um, but certainly, with the exception of the city of Hammond, um, would be the income from the civil fees, uh, which began um, in July, at the beginning of the fiscal year. And those have been on an average around a little over $10,000 per month. But even with those civil fees, and I announced this during the public hearing, um, the, the uh, budget hearings, is that I, even with the, the, the number of cuts that the office has taken, even beginning back in 2016 or 15, which was initially $130,000, I, I just felt like the civil fees could not self-support this marshal's office. And for six months, um, they, they certainly have not. So what is the reimbursement from Tangsville Hope Parish? What's that? For the six months? Yeah, I mean, what is that? It's, just, it's the last, it's $46,000. That's, that's, their, that's their monthly allocation that they, that they give to us. It's, okay. it's um, I think currently it's at $121,000 for the year, and, uh, and it's broken down per, per month. Okay. Are you making similar reports to the Tangipo Parish government and to Ponchatoula City government? As, as far as... To, where, where you are on your six-month update and your request for additional funds? No, I have not. Do you, do you have plans to do that? Certainly. Yeah. Because there was like a cut, like a proportional cut. To, I think that's your point there. Right? You know, so who all is going to share in that shortfall? Keep in mind, by statute, the, the city of Ponchatoula is, is, does not have to allocate funds to, to that office. Mm -hmm. uh, by statute, it's the it's the city in which the um, the city court and the city marshal's office is, is housed, is located, and the parish that um, that the city marshal's office is, is located. Marshal, I I can't keep quiet with that one. Also, I think by statute, the only thing that the city is required is to pay half of your salary. Mm -hmm. That's by statute. Since you brought up statute. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know about the cash balances of, of the accounts. I understand you could operate in a deficit, but if there's money in the bank, that that could also, off, also offset that. Mm -hmm. The city of Hammond, I believe, from what I, in my 11 years of doing this, is the largest contributor to the marshal's office. So uh, I, I, I'm... I'm uh, in, in agreement with Lacey, I would hope to see that you would you would reach out to some of these other agencies to see if they would reinstate some of that money. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's necessarily on the city of Hammond to carry that that whole load. And uh, I think I think that was it. But I, I did want to talk about it. since you brought up the statute. I did want to talk about that because I think that that that's all I've seen that you, we're statutorily required to account for is your salary. Nothing else. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong on that, but I, I believe I, I did a little reading last year for a change, and I, I learned. <laughs> so that's all I have to say. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. So you're looking for a response in the near future on this. Well, obviously, we can't make a decision tonight on what we're mm -hmm. going to do, so we'd have to take this take this under advisement and then. From there. That's all I'm asking. Okay. 
Mayor, to report. Uh, on a lighter note, we uh, had a great weekend at City Hammond. Uh, the barbecue and blues event uh, hosted by Eric Ferris, Lord Bordelon, and Brian Shire was a huge success, so all our uh, local charities should benefit from this weekend. Um, yesterday, or, or Sunday actually, we had an Easter egg hunt, which was uh, pretty exciting for the children. We had 15,000 eggs that were put out in Samaria Park, and within 15 minutes, they were gone. We had, uh, 10 gold eggs, and when they turned into gold eggs, they received $10 uh, per egg. We had four gift uh, baskets, Easter baskets, uh, donated by Elmer's Candy. They donated a lot of candy to the children. So far request donated some free passes for kids to, to play uh, games. Um, we ran the train, the Easter Bunny was there, uh, inflatables, fire truck, uh, free hot dogs for adults and kids. So it was a really great day Sunday uh, for the children in Jamaica Park. And uh, for those who have been asking about building corral, they will be opening within a month and a half finally after a few years of a lot of uh, negotiating between the two parties. So that's going to be exciting for many folks in town. That's my report. Are there any new business like to be recognized tonight in order? If not, approve of minutes. So moved. Second. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Motion approved. Resolution none. Old business none. New business number one. Number one, a resolution authorizing La Coretta Mexican, Mexican Cuisine located at 108 Northwest Railroad Avenue to sell alcohol on the sidewalk in front of the restaurant on Saturday, May 5th, 2018 from 2 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Ms. Jane. Hi. Good evening, Council. Nice to see you. Um, yes, it's that time of year again. Um, we would like to have the um, Council approve a waiver for the um, the alcohol. We're going to sell it right from the patio. We call it the sidewalk, but it's the front patio, um, which we will follow up with an ATC permit as well for that. Motion to approve. Second. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Motion approved. Number two, a resolution authorizing La Coretta Mexican Cuisine to obtain a waiver of the open container law for the Cinco de Mayo celebration on Saturday, May 5th, 2018 from 2 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. within the boundaries of Charles Street to Railroad Avenue and part of Casa de Fraser parking mall. Second. Second. Okay. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilwoman Janice carter Beer. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Janet Blunt. Aye. Motion approved. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. See you May 5th. Number three, a resolution to approve Hammond Tobacco and Beer located at 680 North Morrison Boulevard, Hammond, Louisiana, to sell high low package alcohol. The owner is Hammond Tobacco and Beer Inc., Jenny Wilson. Good afternoon. Hey. Um, this is a new business taken over uh, where the old Circle K was. It's a convenience store and it's um, packaged and they've met all the requirements that we've asked them to meet. And we do have a representative <coughs> here tonight that I'm gonna call up to the podium if y'all have any questions, okay? It's across from Rajmore Parkway. Mm -hmm. It's right across from Rajmore Parkway. Oh, okay. Right, right across from DDD. Right, so you're going to park. Right. Okay. Yeah. Frankie Calli, 1005 Delmar Boulevard, Hammond, and Walid Aradai, 47432 North Morrison Boulevard, Hammond, Louisiana. Uh, I'm representing uh, No Poirier, the owner of the building, uh, which was the former Circle K, and also uh, Walid, who is opening a new business, and uh, it's going to be a convenience store, and eventually we'll sell gas. Yes. the next six months if tanks put in. Any questions? Nope. Hey. Motion to approve. Second. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. 
Number four. Thank you. A resolution to approve food and fund number 23 located at 3151 Highway 190, <coughs> West Hammond, Louisiana, to sell high low package alcohol. The owner is Spoonville Ventures LLC, Jenny Wilson. Um, this is also a convenient type store slash truck stop, deli, packaged um, alcohols with the requesting fuel, lottery tickets. It's a convenient store. That is um, located down by Applebee's across the street is where that's going. And um, they have met all the requirements that we've asked them to meet. Do I have a representative here? He got here at uh, 445 <laughs> on the long ride. He's been here for a long time. Kim Touchette, uh, 1819 Ryan Avenue, New Iberia, Louisiana. Uh, I'm here representing Food and Fun. Uh, I've worked with them for several years, uh, and I'm their operations manager. So, Motion to approve. Second. Councilman Jason Hood. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beer. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Three. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Okay. Motion approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Number five, a resolution to approve budget change form 18-07, transferring $61,671 from unencumbered closed out capital improvement projects to downtown parking improvement, FY 2018. Project number 420-11711 for a revised project budget of 75,000, Chuck Spangler. Good evening. This is the second half of a downtown parking project which we initiated in the fall, if you remember, and we held off completing it not knowing the situation financially. However, there are some funds left in our parking improvement project. I'm consolidating them into one project, and this will basically take care of the parking on the 100 block of West Mars, sort of across the street from the steakhouse, which is now grass. It'll add about 10 parking spaces maybe 12, I don't remember the exact number, Kyle is doing it. And uh, this is a request to consolidate this project into one budget so we can get bids for that work. There's also a little bit of miscellaneous repair on some streets that are busted up that Robert Morgan asked us to take care of since they're a little over street apartments here. They're a little too big and too thick. But it's primarily the parking on the 100 block of West Morris. West Morris. Right by the steakhouse. Pass before you get to the steakhouse. George Tucker, right. next door to his office, all the way down to what used to be where so by the police so station. So it's on that side of the street. I don't I'm know what that side means. Well, George Tucker's on. It's on, it's the, on the north side of the road. George Tucker's side of West Mars. Okay. And there's another other, like there's a salon and a couple other businesses on that stretch. They have to put their garbage cans across the road. I don't know how they wheel those in that traffic. But anyway, that's the nature of this reallocation of funds. <clears throat> Motion to approve. Second. <clears throat> Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Motion approved. <clears throat> number six, a resolution to approve budget change form number 18-06, transferring 59900 from Mooney Park Improvement Project 4201209. 6,600 from other park improvement project 4201-1511 and 1,800 from Z-Mary Park Improvements project 4201708, 42,700 from Clark Park Improvements project 4201709 and 35,000 from Jackson Park Improvements project 4201710 to Park Restroom Additions project 4201180. Eight zero eight. Now, this is a mouthful. This is what it looks like. <laughs> uh, what's occurred here is, is two years, a year and a half ago, if you remember, we built a splash park in Murray Park. Do you all remember the construction of a splash park? Which is very popular. The health department allowed us to construct that splash park with the uh, a conception that, with, with the idea that we would have to place a restroom facility within 500 feet of the splash park within two years. So that two years isn't quite up, but it's gonna be up at the end of this coming calendar year. So as we talked about, the mayor and I in the park, the recreation people discussed this. There's a number of needs at a number of the parks. So we've tried to consolidate those. And we, I say the mayor and Lacey and myself and architects have tried to consolidate the funds and try to build some four 
stall bathrooms and if you've been to Chapapila, if any of you have not been everybody been to Chapapila? Yeah. Well there's a restroom right by the trailhead that's a great it's a unisex uh, diaper changing facility, handicap accessible and very secure. One person goes in, they close the door and there's a bathroom. It's almost like four porta johns right. back to back. Very secure, people like it, they feel safe. Rather than the open bathrooms that seem to be a problem for kids and so forth. So we took the top three, which was uh, Zamuri, Clark, and Jackson Park, and those will be put into a construction project that Holly and Smith is going to be, uh, I think is going to be named later as the architect, since they did the design of Chapapila. And if money allows, we're also going to do Mooney. And then the next year or two, we'll do Martin Luther King, which is a little more major of a problem because there's already a facility there that has to be de dealt with and Kate Square, which is another problem because there's a lot of controversy over whether or not that's a, a realistic location for one. So the three we're going to take initially, for sure, are Zamuri, Clark, Jackson. And you're going to build restrooms in those? The restrooms will be built at those three, the three and then locations. there'll be an alternate bid from Mooney. The reason we took Mooney as the alternate is there's a bathroom there. It's, it works. I mean, it's not the best thing in the world, and these would be a lot nicer, a lot cleaner, but the Mooney would have to be built did as an alternate. Because with $200,000, we're not so sure we can afford to do more than three. So that's the nature. We've consolidated all these various park appropriations over a couple of years, and there's 10,000 here and 15. That's why you got a long list. Kind of packed them in and taking care of some of the problems. And I do believe it'll be of great benefit to the, you know, a lot of the other playgrounds and so forth that we've been getting through grants. We really hadn't had to need a lot of this, these appropriations. And this will, we paved some stuff at Clark Park, if you've been out there. I know you have paved their parking lot and we've done some things at Mooney, put a splash park there. So this is, this is the nature of this budget change form, to come up with a project budget and proceed with some will, new bathrooms. Will each park have a four? They'll four, have identical. They'll all be they'll identical. Be identical. They'll be just like, very similar to Chappie. They won't, probably won't be identical, will they be but it's the same architect. Chappie? Sir? They'll be nicer? They'll be nicer. Initially, they'll be way nicer. So, so you say if we can keep them nice, is a real challenge we all have, as you know, because parks are not always inhabited, so you have a little more issues with vandalism and so forth, especially some of the more isolated locations. And you say this was for parks who are, uh, I mean, that had splash parks and, and within the And did not have period, bathrooms. Yeah. And did not have bathrooms. Not have bathroom. The health department allowed Mooney, because there's a bathroom there, and it's open, and in use, it's open. Yes, ma'am. Kylan Douglas assured me he just played basketball there and the bathroom works. I'll check on my way home because there's do, do so. in my house because all I know is a porta potty. No, it's Kylan, Well, there, used, there is a porta potty there, but mm -hmm. he said the bathrooms They're are open and they're cleaned. All right. I'll have to kick that up with Kylan because mm -hmm. I'm going to put him on record as being responsible for that information. He did the site plans for all these, by the way. Okay. So he's not responsible for the porta potty. Sir? He's not responsible. No, <laughs> but uh, so far as I know, uh, I've lived there for years, and uh, I think that uh, bathroom at Mooney Park been uh, uh, had a boat lock on it since I was what seventeen. I'm fifty nine. Well, the, I'm certainly not going to argue with you. You're the council person for that district. I will say that is the fourth of the four, and then hopefully we'll have the money to do it. If not, maybe there'll be a way of coming up with the money when that bid's taken to make it work. You know, the ones that. Chapapila were around the forty-four thousand dollar each, so five times forty-four is over two hundred thousand. We're hoping maybe since we're bidding multiple parks, we might get a little tighter prices, better prices. So that's gonna we'll find that out in a couple of months when you take bids. Okay. That's the nature of this budget change. You won't see me again. <coughs> Jeffrey Smith will handle this from here on out. I was just handling the budget change, or whoever the. The whole point is to get rid of those poor pods. Next fiscal year, we plan on doing if money doesn't get done, money in, in, uh, MLK. and uh, MLK. And, uh, MLK. So is it 295 or 196? Well, you look at the, it says, it says appropriation, revised appropriations in bold. Top line. Okay. The, the top, it'll be around right at 200,000 is what will be in that project budget. Motion to approve. Second. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Motion to approve. Number seven. 
A resolution to authorize the mayor to enter into an agreement with Holly and Smith Architects to design restroom for Clark, Jackson, Z. Mary, and Mooney Park. Lacey Landrum. You've already heard Chuck describe the project. Uh, both Holly and Smith and Chuck Spangler's office will be working on this together, but we're requesting your permission to go ahead and hire Holly and Smith as the architect for the project. I just have one question, Mr. President. So since we already have a master plan proposed, which we should hopefully get a, get approved here real soon once we finish up the pool component of it, do we, do we also update the master plan to show these restaurants, I mean restaurants, these, these restrooms in that master plan so that we can make sure that that's inclusive in that project that makes sense? I don't think it would be necessary to include them in the master plan, but I, that would be an additional cost in addition well, to- having, they, have, they haven't given us the final on the master plan yet anyway, so it's still pending the final drawing from Holly and Smith. So can we at least ask them if they can incorporate that in the master plan since it's going to be there anyway? When we asked them about changing the pool dimensions, that was going to be an additional cost. So I think they have given us, that we just haven't. No, we haven't received it. 500 feet away from us. We haven't accepted the master plan from. That's correct. Council. I was going to say it just hasn't come to council, right. but yes. they so, have. So it's still pending. So, I mean, maybe we can ask them. I mean, we can ask I, them. I can certainly ask them again if yeah. you would like. Okay. Sure. I would. Because I think it should be a part of the comprehensive plan. Usually, that'll be fine. All right, thanks. Motion to approve. Second. Councilman Jason Hood? Aye. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard? Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall? Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt? Aye. Motion approved. Number eight, a resolution to approve budget change form number 18 08, transferring 10000 from East Church Lighting Project. 4201162 to Church, Church Street Lighting Project 4201712, Lacey Landrum. This is a housekeeping effort. In both fiscal years, in two separate fiscal years, we had $10,000 allocated to go towards East Church Lighting Project. This is just to combine those two together since the purpose is for the same project. Um, Councilman Blunt has been working with Intergy to get clarification about the status of the project. It's my understanding from speaking with Intergy today that they have now marked the trees. We will be cutting the trees and going forward and we'll have a better cost estimate of the final cost for the project. And so any of the reserve funds, of course, that we don't spend won't be spent. But this is just to consolidate the two allocations that were made in two separate fiscal years for the project as a whole. Motion to approve. Second. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Motion approved. Number nine, a resolution to approve change order number two and final for Hammond North Shore Regional Airport, phase three drainage improvement state project number H011255, project number 6161702. Jay Pittman. Jay's taking care of triplets. Um, I'm handling this on Jay's behalf. This is a, a bookkeeping change order. So final change order. The project is complete. It is 100% DOTD funds. There's no local funds, but it is a change order with a credit changing the final contract price by $254.88 to a final contract price of $590,966.04. I recommend we approve change order number two, final. Motion to approve. Second. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Motion approved. Number 10, a resolution to approve final acceptance on Hammond North Shore Regional Airport Phase 3 drainage improvements. State project number H011255, project number 616. 11702. This will be a close out of that project withholding 5% retainage for and commencing the lien period. Same project. Motion to approve. Second. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Motion approved. Number 11. A resolution authorizing the mayor on behalf of the city of Hammond to sign an engineering agreement in the amount of 
with Spangler Engineering LLC for engineering including production of plans and specifications, required components of the city full application to the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, construction inspection, testing and quality assurance, and related engineering fees for improvements to South Wastewater Treatment Plant under the Clean Water State Revolving Fund Project CS221742-01 as included in the city's <coughs> approved pre-application. This amount will be fully reimbursed by the city's $2,085,000 CWSRF loan, Charles Brochure. Tanya, I want to apologize for the length of that first sentence. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a mouthful. It was long. Uh, basically what this is, is in the Clean Water State Revolving Fund application that has been pre-approved for the $2,085,000, one of the components of our full application is plans and specifications. So we have to retain our contractor, in this case Spangler Engineering, uh, to produce those plans and specifications in order to complete our full application. I've been assured by DEQ, um, the state DEQ, um, that these funds, they're EPA dollars, they're on hand. We've been pre-approved for the loan amount once they've received and reviewed our final application. Those funds are ours. We can use those funds because this amount for engineering is in the pre-application. We can use that amount to immediately reimburse ourselves for any cost incurred up to the point of the full application and then beyond. And the total amount right now for engineering is 185000 So, So in the meantime, those funds will come from what we will do, I, I say this here, I think she can speak to this more directly, but what we typically do like with grants, we'll do the same thing here. We'll set up a project account in Munis. We'll have funds set aside um, for engineering uh, when those funds are received as part of the, the final loan amount. Um, we'll reimburse our, ourselves from that. So it'll be set up as a, as a receivable in the future. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Motion approved. Thank you. Number 12, a resolution to declare the unlawful distribution of opioid medications and opioid addiction and a public nuisance. Lacey Landrum. Um, this I know is an unusual request for tonight. We have been, I've been going to a lot of trainings lately on um, drugs throughout our community. And one of the recent trainings that Andre Kudring went to as our city attorney was also discussing some of the major lawsuits that have been brought forward um, in our multi-district litigation, uh, which is just consolidation of all of those cases nationally uh, against drug manufacturers and other folks after the local entities have declared opioids um, a public nuisance. And I know there's some uh, question about that language and we can certainly address that. Um, but just to emphasize kind of what we have been doing on a local effort, uh, the resolution speaks to a lot of about what has happened on a national effort in terms of the, um, the declarations of public health epidemic and the declarations of public health emergency from the President of the United States. Um, the resolution also contains language about 91 Americans die every day from opioid or overdose with more than 15,000 deaths involving prescription opioids alone in 2015. Um, LMA, the Louisiana Municipal Association, recently had their cover article dealing with this subject. And I know uh, when I attended the City County Managers Association, the International Conference last fall, we had several sessions addressing this um, that is going on nationally. Um, in uh, Louisiana, 675 Louisiana residents die from prescription overdoses every year. Uh, Louisiana has seen death by drug overdoses triple since 1999. And Louisiana is, is one of the top 10 states for drug overdose death rates. Tanchpaho Parish is reported to have the second highest rating in Louisiana for opioid abuse. Um, I think one of the most striking things that comes out is that there are more opioid prescriptions out there than we have residents, which means that there are several people out there using prescriptions um, and having multiple prescriptions for it because I know that I personally don't have one um, and never have. So it's, it is uh, <clears throat> something that is definitely we see on multiple fronts. Um, just in reviewing our coroner's report, which is a very 
you know, uh, difficult thing to challenging thing to sign each month. But um, just in reviewing that, the city of Hammond alone has spent between fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year um, on. Um, drug overdoses and, and toxicology reports and all the things that go into that. The, the years spanning that is we've seen this both in male and females um, from someone as young as 19 years old all the way up to someone as old as 65 years old. So it's a wide span and age range. Um, it is impacting all of us and it is impacting every district I will say based on the addresses of where these folks have lived. Um, some of the things locally we've tried to do uh, is we do get we do field calls at City Hall for treatment and assistance. Um, so that has become something that we've we've gotten a little better at doing. Of course, we are not um, the main healthcare providers by any means. I know Councilman Marshall has probably a lot more experience in this area. Um, we do carry Narcan, um, which is the nasal spray to help people uh, recover from an overdose. Um, and our first responders have been working with Dr. Foster, who helped us craft our policies and procedures for how they would be using the Narcan sprays. Um, we have 150 that are coming to police. And then uh, with our fire trucks, we originally had um, an injectable one that was, uh, we, were, we were worried about um, carrying all those needles and everything. So they have changed over to the Narcan spray. Um, and. Some of the other things we've done is a safe disposal site. That's another best practice lift, listed for communities. We have one of those uh, at the police station. Anybody is welcome at any time to just place drugs into that. Uh, it's it's almost like a, a post office box. It really is. Um, it's like you're it's like you're going to mail a letter, and it's simple as that. You just it's right there in the front. There are no questions asked about it, um, and that it's privacy great, great location for that. That privacy is important though, um, and it's taken very seriously. Um, and and in fact, even our narcotics agents, um, you know, they they've seen such a <clears throat> such an influx of of drugs throughout our community, um, and. We see so many people shifting from who may have started with opioids, you know, due to an injury, due to a back surgery, due to something that seems pretty routine, um, and then they shift over to the much more cheaper heroin. I mean, it's just, um, it's heartbreaking. There was a, a young girl who was in my office last year who was 20 years old, um, and she was using meth to come down off of heroin, and she had started on, on this path through multiple ways. And so there, this is impacting every part of our community, and it's definitely something that the purpose of tonight is really to increase public awareness and engagement. It's also to place that stake in the ground um, so that if we decide as a local government entity that we wish to hire legal counsel and join in um, the multi-district litigation, this would give us the tool um, and the declaration to do so. Um, at this point, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I will just end with saying that there are municipalities across the nation that have done something very similar and used this same um, public nuisance language to try to abate the, the problem. And, and this gives us the tools and opens the door to more resources and potentially even grant funding um, to to move forward and to try to abate this problem that's in our community. Mr. President, I uh, <clears throat> have a comment on this because I had a chance to, to share this with some of our physicians <clears throat> and just for you for the rest of the information that um, in Louisiana, we have the largest usage of opioids with pregnant women. Oh. So I don't know if you, if you realize that. So mm -hmm. that is a a big issue that we deal with on a regular basis, or at least our physicians do. And one of the concerns that uh, Dr. Mabry wanted me to bring to the group tonight when I asked her the question, is the language that really bothers her is just the fact that we would identify people <coughs> um, who, are, who are addicted to opioids as a nuisance um, because they're patients. And, they, you know, and so there's a direct correlation between mental health and opioid usage as well, and the language that could also say that people with mental health could become a nuisance. Um, I mean, we have a large problem with other diseases and different um, you know, uh, problems or addictions within our community, and so just the concern of that particular word 
we gave them pause, and uh, outside of that, there was really no issue. It's just that, you know, just to, when we think, think of it from a patient perspective, do we want to refer to people who are, who are addicted to opioids as a nuisance? Uh, I would just challenge us to try to rethink that language. I know maybe from a legal perspective it makes sense, but from a health, if it's a national, it is a major epidemic in our, in our country, and I just don't know if it makes sense to refer to um, those patients, and many of them have mental health illnesses as well, as a nuisance, and what does that really mean? And then the last thing is, what's the exposure from a community, a city, when you know a person is now deemed a nuisance to the society because they are addicted to opioids? I'm just concerned about that language, and I wish we would find a, if we can find a, you know, maybe deterrent is a, or detriment is a better word than nuisance, especially because we're, we're referring to the act, not the person. That's really the issue, not the, not the person. A person shouldn't really be identified as a nuisance. And so, on behalf of my physician group, wanted to make sure that that was clear. And I talked to four different physicians. And I asked him to read the resolution, and each physician had the same response, which was, why are you referring to the patients as a nuisance? And, that, and I think that we can, we can correct that language, you know, I think that, because, because it makes sense, you know, because, you know, you can say that, I mean, you know, if it's a cost associated with it without going too long, but, you know, Sexually transmitted transmit disease is a, is a bigger issue. It's a huge issue in our community. We spend lots of, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in treating, treating that and cities pay for that. Through, you go to your public health department right now and they could tell you right now, we spend thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars in treating for that and that could be, again, you know, you can say that's a nuisance too if you wanted to label nuisances as different stages of, um, of um, diseases or or addictions. There's no particular drug that these pharmaceutical companies are manufacturing that are creating problems for STDs. So, I mean, this is more of a legal thing. And like you said, the doctors don't necessarily agree with it, but this is all about the legality of being able to move forward down the road, correct? Yeah, I mean, again, the, the, uh, the governments who have passed similar resolutions refer to it as a nuisance because that's the word we use in law. And, and nuisance is meant to be broad. It's certainly not a swipe at individuals, but it's really broad, and that means anything that is, 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 uh, impedes or, um, as your word, in detriment, which is an acceptable sure, word, to public good, public safety, good order. So in terms of legally, I mean, I wouldn't see a distinction between changing the word public nuisance to a detriment to the public. I mean, to me, it's the same legal effect, and that well, the is the problem. Is a different. If, you def if you look up the two yes. words, no. those well, are well, I understand that, 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 that creates some sensibilities in, in, the, you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the medical community. So, mm -hmm. But legally, I would say that I don't think it would make a difference if this were changed to read detriment okay. to the public yeah. rather yeah. than a nuisance. So, and, if that, and if that is the case, Andre, and I appreciate that, if, if, that's, if you're good with that, I would just, you know, if we're, if we're going to approve, approve this, I would recommend that we reconsider the, the, the term and how do we put the word detriment in there versus a nuisance so we can not identify people as a nuisance to community. So would the language be a public detriment? Yeah, detriment to the public. A detriment to the public? Yeah, rather than using public nuisance. I would like, I mean, we... And you can take time no, to redo it if you want to. We can approve it at next... Right. In no place in the resolution do we say that addicts right. are the pe or the people Correct. are that. We say that opioid addiction is a disease that affects people of both sexes and race, ethnic groups. I think in the, in the now, now be resolved, it says that, it says that uh, <clears throat> opioid addiction is a public nuisance. Says it right there. It says the the addiction, says, the actual case of being right. addicted, not the people. Right. Yeah, I mean it's not intended to be a swipe at right. individuals. But, but, right. but you know, if, if words matter and that's simple, we can change that. I would love to see that. And I think that the help. I talked to uh, Gina Lagarde. She didn't get a chance to get back with me, but you know, she is the director of public health for Tangible Parish, and I'm sure she would agree at the same level that just for the sake of how we phrase that and the potential exposure, because if we're 
assuming that people are a public nuisance, then what does that really mean? Does that lead to anything else? I think that's the point we're trying to make is that it's not directed at people, it's directed at the addiction and it's directed at the distribution of the opioid medication. Mm -hmm. It doesn't it doesn't say opioid addicts or but that's <clears throat> it's up to the council what they wish to do. Mr. President, if possible, I'd like to just, if, if since Andre is agreeing, if we can table and give them a chance to maybe change that language from a nuisance to detrimental, I think that would be, I would, I would, I would ask that we table the motion and um, allow the administration to rephrase the language to exclude a public nuisance to something more, uh, I guess, something that would reflect more of detrimental. So a motion to table. Motion to table. Yes, it'll give them enough time to fix it, then we can do it, address it. The, the next. only thing I would, I would recommend. Unless if you could do it, yeah, if I mean, you could make the change now, that's fine. Yeah, because we, we talked about we really could amend the, only, the motion. The only way that um, the um, nuisance was used is in the res in re resolution part, right. the resolve. So it is to right. change that rather than. Uh, unlawful distribution of opioid medications and opioid addiction, rather than saying it's a public nuisance, saying that is a detriment to the public. I mean, and I, that's just really simple. That's the only. I change. could. I would. I would move that we amend the amend the resolution to to say that uh, uh, it would be a detriment to the public versus a public yes. nuisance. Is that the only language? Because uh, just just a couple. Just in the, just in the resolution. Well, I, I know. I just yeah. want it. Uh, so it supports efforts to abate this nuisance. So what we would abate this, this detriment. detriment. Mm -hmm. And so also in the in the in the uh, header of it, in the resolution itself, rather than calling it a public nuisance, a detriment to the public. So it's those three places: right. the header and in the two places in the uh, resolution part. I'd appreciate it, and I know they would appreciate that. So that's my motion, vote motion to amend. Second. Councilman Jason Hood? Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt? Aye. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard? Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall? Aye. Motion to amend, to amend detriment to the public. A resolution to declare the unlawful distribution of opioid medications and opioid addiction a detriment to the public. So now we would need a vote. Motion to approve. Second. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilwoman Janice Carter Beard. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Motion approved. Andre, Mr. Kudrain, will you will you do as normal in the past? Will you take uh, input from us possibly whenever you seek uh, other counsel if this is not something you handle? Yeah, just I to know be. You've done that in the past because I happen to know someone that that's kind of wrapped up in this well, I mean term. I think the intention is to come back yeah. if we if we choose that we want to join you know okay. by, by filing a lawsuit yeah. we can talk about that what that means what that does well if you do I, yes sir. you've done I've certainly seen you've yes, done sir. that in the past okay yes sir. yes sir thank you number 13 a resolution to authorize the mayor to enter into agreement with Castorius Associates LLC to design hangers for the airport Lacey Landrum this is a contract uh, to hire um, Tom Pistorius as the architect um, to finish his design for the hangers. This is the uh, $600,000 to build two, 10 T hangers that um, was approved in the budget um, for, this, for this fiscal year. And so this is to move forward with his contract. Mr. President, if there's no motion or second, then you can declare this to be um, d uh, I guess fail for failure to have a motion if there's no motions or second. Okay. 
Ja. Så det er ja. Okay, let's go on to the next item. Final adoption of an ordinance. Final adoption of an ordinance to amend the city of Hammond budget for fiscal year 2017-2018 in accordance with the procedure set within section 5-03 of the city of Hammond charter. So move. Second. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Motion approved. Number two. Final adoption of an ordinance to approve an expanded conditional use request by Channing Garrett, applicant to allow placement of 2012 mobile home with chassis meet all code requirements on lot 11, square four Kenmore Edition, located at 606 Capitol Street, zone RS3, recommended and denied by Zoning Commission. Tracy Shalacy. Just want to state for the record that I'm Channing Garrett. Channing Garrett, for the record, I um, just want to apologize for um, being late. And uh, this project here, uh, I'd definitely like to move forward with. Uh, I'm going to apply to all the rules that's uh, given to me. And uh, the engineer as well, he's uh, going to have the guidelines set out for the elevation and also the, uh, the uh, floodway system as well. And uh, I talked to Ms. Tracy as well, and she's uh, willing to buy by the uh, everything as well. So, Mr. President, just for clarification, I think that we're approving this allow the mobile home to be placed there, right. and then then everything else has to happen through the zoning and planning commission. Is that right? Yes. Well, it's really not the planning and zoning; it's I mean, really to the zoning. building department, building so department, permit office. Permit office. Permit office. Yeah. So all we're really doing is to request is to approve for that trailer up there, right? Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Councilman Jason Hood. Aye. Councilman Lamar Marshall. Aye. Councilman Johnny Blunt. Aye. Motion approved. Thank you. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Everybody's. Aye. Aye. Aye.